Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the fifth meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital, digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. The first item is to hear evidence on the Draft Scotland Act 1998 modification of Schedule 5 Order 2015 from Derek Mackay, the Minister for Transport and Islands, and Brendan Rooney, Road Safety Policy Officer at Transport Scotland. This instrument is laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions may come into force. Following the evidence session, the Committee will be invited to consider a motion to approve the instrument under Agenda Item 2. Can I welcome the witnesses this morning and can I invite the Minister to make any opening remarks? Thank you, Convener, and good morning, uh, Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to set out this Government's reasoning behind the measures you are considering today. This is an order made under Section 30 of the Scotland Act 1998 to devolve legislative competence to the Scottish Parliament in respect of the provision of seatbelts on school buses. The safety of Scotland's children and young people is a responsibility that we all share, and as Minister for Transport and Islands, it's my resolute belief that the journey to and from school is a key consideration in those efforts. When parents wave their children off to school in the mornings, they expect all of us with responsibilities in this area to do everything we can to ensure they are cared for and kept safe. That's why, in March last year, my predecessor, Keith Brown, announced that the Scottish Government intends to introduce legislation to ensure that seatbelts are provided in all dedicated school transport in Scotland. I'm glad that local government also share our endeavours in this important safety measure, with 17 councils in Scotland already stipulating seatbelts as a condition in dedicated school transport contracts, and if other six in some provision, such as vehicles carrying primary children. Around 85% of dedicated school buses in Scotland currently have seatbelts fitted. However, we are clear that all children on dedicated home-to-school transport should benefit from this important safeguard and intend to bring forward legislation in the next Scottish Parliament. We have reached agreement with the UK Government on the terms of this Scotland Act order, and I am pleased that the process has, reached, has now reached a stage where it is before committee today, following passage at the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee last week. Although formal consultation and such associated legislative considerations are still some way in the future, we have taken the early opportunity to work closely with local authority partners and other key stakeholders. Transport Scotland has set up the Seatbelts on School Transport Working Group to help prepare for smooth transition and to look at best practice for ensuring children wear seatbelts when they are provided. The aim is for this order to be approved at both Holyrood and Westminster before the UK general election and for it to be made at the first available Privy Council in the summer. Uh, these are the steps that the Government is taking to ensure we are well placed to take forward our future plans and invite questions from the committee members in terms of the Section 30 order. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that opening statement. Can I now invite members to ask any questions they may have on the order? Dave. Yeah, thank you, Kavir. Uh, I just wanted to put on the record <coughs> uh, perhaps the, uh, the Minister would agree that we should thank the uh, petitioner who did all the work for many years on road safety uh, and thank also, I think, the work that the Petitions Committee has done in this particular issue. Uh, perhaps I should declare an interest as the formal convener of the committee, um, but I do think it's a good example of how ordinary petitioners can go ahead, raise issues of concern and actually get some action on this. As you know, the Petitions Committee was heavily involved with the UK Government as well, and I'm very pleased that this Section 30 order has been agreed. I think road I think safety to and from school is vitally important. I think it's a great initiative, and I would strongly support it, Convener. Thank you. Um, Alex? Very briefly, uh, while I have no real issues uh, with the uh, order we have in front of us, I wonder if the Minister would at this stage be able to give an indicative timescale of completing the process of putting uh, regulations in place? Well, can I say, first of all, to go back to David Stewart's comment around the success of this Parliament, I think that is fair comment that a petitioner, citizens of Scotland, can raise matters of importance to them uh, in the very heart of our democracy, and we can take forward that where we have the power, and even in this instance where we didn't have the power, but seek it to deliver on those aspirations, and I think that's fair comment. Of course, even this Section 30 order is very specific, so we will only be able to set the 
the rule around the application of seatbelts, but not necessarily the specification of what kind of seatbelt, because there is a particular request around three-point uh, seatbelts. So it would be better, of course, if we had greater power to be able to be more prescriptive, but maybe we can achieve that through uh, guidance rather than necessarily uh, always uh, legislation. There are other measures that I would want to take forward as well as Transport Minister, such as improved signage uh, on school buses, which another petitioner to the Parliament has raised. Another example where this Parliament, I as Minister, don't have the power to make that decision, but will continue to pursue that with UK Government. So in addition to the Smith Commission and the general election and the, the work through the command paper, there are other areas that we will want to pursue on a cross-party basis, further powers to be able to make uh, our young people even safer. So that was a consensual point um, to, to take forward the, the, the agreement around uh, the, uh, the principle there uh, around empowerment. In terms of Alec Johnson's point around uh, time scales, if the power it was achieved, uh, the earliest we could introduce legislation would be uh, in the first uh, year of the next session of the Scottish Parliament because of the time it will take for the order to go through, approval of the Privy Council. So it would really be a matter for the next Scottish Parliament. So this Scottish Government has uh, committed to introduce legislation very quickly and to achieve that time scale of implementation for 2018 uh, for vehicles uh, transporting primary school children in 2021 for vehicles carrying secondary pupils to achieve that, then we would have to bring forward legislation in good time. You may also put uh, the point that, well, isn't it presumptuous that this Scottish Government will be the next Scottish Government? Well, I think even because of the level of cross-party support, any party surely would want to continue with this legislation, uh, legislation having had the power uh, to do so, and with the cross-party support that the policy seems to have. So I hope that gives further clarity on the timescales around legislation. Thank you, Minister. Do members have any further comments or questions for the Minister? Okay, in that case, uh, we then move on to the second agenda item, which is the formal consideration of motion S4M12372, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the Draft Scotland Act 1998 modification of Schedule 5 Order 2015. Can I invite the Minister to speak to and move motion S4M12372? Move. Happy, happy to move. I think I've made the case in the comments, unless there's any further discussion required. Okay. Are there any further comments and questions from members? Okay. I put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M 12372 in the name of Derek Mackay be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. That concludes the consideration of this affirmative instrument. We will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament. And I'll now allow a short suspension for a changeover of witnesses. Thank the Minister and uh, his official for their attendance and evidence this morning. Thank you.
meeting of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. The third item on the agenda today is for the committee to take evidence on its freight transport in Scotland inquiry. And this week the committee will hear from port operators. Can I welcome Charles Hammond, Chief Executive Officer at Fourth Ports, David McGinley, Director of Commercial Marine at Babcock International Group, Colin Parker, Chief Executive of Aberdeen Harbour, and John Patterson, the Chief Executive of Montrose Port Authority. Can I invite members, well before, do you have an opening statement, gentlemen, that you would like to make? Uh, good, good morning, uh, Mr. Convener, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm happy to make a very general statement just to kick things off. Um, as you've said, I'm the Chief Executive of Fourth Ports. Um, we are the third largest ports grouping in the United Kingdom. Um, our business is split roughly 55% uh, London and 45% in Scotland. We handle just under 40 million tonnes of cargo, of which about 26 million tonnes is handled in Scotland. We do operate uh, seven ports and terminals in the Forth and Tay estuaries, a number of regional ports, and I would argue a national port, which is the port of Grangemouth. Um, we're involved in a number of different projects, but I suppose the key thing to say to you is what we're trying to do for Scotland is support the key industries in Scotland, so the food and drink sector, the agricultural sector, the chemical sector, North Sea oil and gas sector. Um, these are all important industries for Scotland. Uh, we seek to support them in the infrastructure facilities and services which we deliver. So I'd be very happy to answer any of your questions uh, in more detail as we go along. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr Hammond. Perhaps we could kick off then by asking each of you in turn to provide us with an overview of the, the ports that you represent, port or ports that you represent and their significance to the wider Scottish economy. Perhaps I could start with Mr Patterson. Thank you very much. Um, start with the smallest first. The port of Montrose is a small port by comparison to the, uh, my colleagues on my left here. Uh, but uh, it is of uh, particular importance for the county of Angus and Perthshire and Southern Aberdeenshire and Fife, uh, in that um, it handles cargoes of some 600,000 tonnes per annum. Uh, and the main uh, cargoes are um, bulks of... Uh, imports of fertiliser, of pulp for the paper mills, um, of grain both ways, import and export, um, dependent upon the successes of the, of the harvests in the area. Um, the the fertiliser is probably the largest industry that we support uh, in Montrose itself. There are two blending companies of fertiliser in the port and uh, that is a, the, the most important um, industry for us on a year-round basis. There are other seasonal um, productions of exports uh, where we have with roundwood um, and uh, the, the crops that, that arise out of the agriculture. We also have a significant business in metal iron, scrap metal iron, uh, both outwards and inwards. Then we have the oil-related um, shipping. Uh, much of it doesn't carry a lot of cargo, but uh, uh, it's a very important visitor to the port because there the larger ships do the, all their crew changes, so there's quite a throughput of personnel in and out of the port. And uh, it has made the port particularly busy in the past um, three years, since um, late in 2011, when we were able to uh, complete the rebuilding of a quay that had collapsed way back in 2003. So the throughput has doubled in, in the past seven years. Uh, since we've done those improvements to the port. And that's the general outlook. Thank okay, you. That, that's helpful. Mr Parker. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Aberdeen Harbour, like Montrose, is a trust port, a single entity port, unlike Charles's uh, group. Uh, we are the main commercial port serving the northeast of Scotland. We had e roughly 8,000 vessel arrivals last year, around about 4.7 million tonnes of cargo, links with 41 different countries, that's cargo arriving from or departing to through, through Aberdeen, so it's an international hub. A lot of that is oil and gas related. We are the principal support harbour for the North Sea and west of Shetland. But also we have um, scheduled services to West Africa. Two, two companies uh, operate scheduled services. So we average somewhere between four and six uh, sailings a, a month to, to West Africa. And another um, busy trade at the moment is supporting the drilling operations at the Falkland Islands as well. So there's a cargo ship due shortly, which will be about our fifth this year heading for the Falkland Islands. We have our uh, Lifeline ferry services um, operated by Circo Northlink, linking us with um, Orkney and Shetland, which provide vital services like supplies for the supermarkets and the fish farms <coughs> in, the, in the Northern Isles, as well as a, a freight service um, operated by Streamline, but also bringing uh, down livestock from the Northern Islands and roughly about 155,000 passengers a year use the ferry. We have scrap metal imports to a small extent, but significant scrap metal exports. Um, calcium carbonate slurry comes into Aberdeen Harbour and goes from the harbour by rail and by uh, road to all over the UK, coatings for the paper industry. Um, we have some cruise vessels, not many, but I think we had 10 last year and we're expecting roughly the same or slightly more this year. We export timber as well, round, round timber to the Baltic states. The other thing that we're currently heavily engaged in is an expansion uh, plan for um, a bay just to the south of the existing harbour. And we're looking at, at today's cost, roughly about a £320 million expansion plan to meet the demands of our customers. So for the last four and a half years, we've been uh, working on this plan. It's been recognised by the Scottish Government under National Planning Framework 3 as being strategically significant for Scotland. We're currently engaged in an environmental impact assessment for that, shortly be building a physical scale model. Um, and um, all being well, we hope to start construction in 2017, completed by 2020. And that's the main summary of Aberdeen Harbour. Okay, thank you. Mr. McGinley. Uh, good morning. Um, we are kind of the, the exact opposite. We're a, a, a large engineering support business with a dockyard uh, and, a, and a port attached to it. So in, in that sense, the port operation is not uh, our main business. However, um, it is becoming uh, far more uh, of, a, of a strategic uh, requirement for us as we see the move uh, f away from Ministry of Defence work and uh, further into uh, commercial activity. And in terms of commercial activity on the site at the moment, uh, we are uh, about to deliver the back end of Quad 204 for BP, which is uh, undersea uh, um, and subsea work for uh, uh, Shahalian Field. Uh, we are uh, engaging in a number of other uh, large um, uh, fabrication um, uh, jobs for the Ministry of Defence. Uh, clearly, we, we still have on the site uh, till 2018 uh, the two aircraft carriers, uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, and that's taking up uh, a considerable amount of our time and consuming a fair amount of our facility. But within the port itself, um, we deliver aggregate, uh, salt, uh, we take cargoes through like wood, uh, we delivered a, a number of large wind farm um, uh, uh, business, uh, jobs last year, about 180,000 tonne of wind farms. And uh, we also are supporting the oil and gas uh, support vessels for uh, the North Sea. So we're taking refit, repair and maintenance jobs from them. Key customers in, in that area are the likes of Shell, Helix, Bibby, Fugro, uh, BP, Sub-C7. So we, we're establishing ourselves in that market in a fairly a strong and positive way. But as I say, it's early days for us yet, um, but we are, we are moving forward in that area. Thank you. 
perhaps just an overview in some of the, um, the ports. Uh, difficult to cover them briefly, but if, if I start with Grangemouth, Grangemouth is clearly strongly integrated with the refinery there, and we are heavily involved with Ineos in the new project to import uh, ethane uh, to make that chemicals business more viable for the future. Uh, Grangemouth is Scotland's largest container handling facility. Many of the whisky exports that are going out to all areas of the world are going through Grangemouth. We're looking very uh, carefully at expanding the capacity in the facilities at Grangemouth, which will involve dredging and deepening, new equipment, new IT systems, all of which will take Grangemouth's capacity well into the 220,000 boxes plus from a current level of about 155,000 containers. So uh, some major investment planned there. Equally, at other ports at Dundee, um, David's uh, mentioned some of the um, North Sea oil and gas fabrication work. We have a similar setup at Dundee, although, of course, we, our main business is the ports business, so we are carefully looking at uh, an expansion of facilities there, uh, key site facilities and fabrication facilities, not only to support North Sea oil and gas, but in the long-term future, capable of also handling loadouts for the offshore renewables industry as well. Similarly, at Leith, we are also heavily involved there in the North Sea oil and gas um, servicing, demobilisation, fabrication, support services, many vessels call it Leith. And again, we're considering a major project to free up significant areas of land at Leith to facilitate decommissioning and uh, similar types of work. Uh, we support agriculture throughout our ports, and obviously at Resythe, we also uh, handle the Resythe Zeebrugge ferry. So that's a very brief overview. Uh, happy to go into any more detail as we go along. Thank you very much. It's evident from what each of you have said this morning that ports are integral to other economic activities that are taking place in Scotland and perhaps to unlocking Scotland's economic potential in the future. Have any of you undertaken an economic impact assessment of the economic footprint um, of the ports in terms of any direct jobs and what the economists refer to as induced effects? Is that something that you have done or would consider doing? Details. Please. Okay. Um, as, as part of the, the, the sort of study into the feasibility of Nig Bay, Scottish Enterprise commissioned a, a company to do an economic impact of the activity related to a harbour being in Aberdeen. I'm not saying all this activity actually operates through through the harbour. And they came away with the, the, the figure of 12,000 full-time equivalent jobs and 1.5 billion GVA. Uh, so that, that was the figure. There is a, a, a wider figure that B British Ports Association commissioned uh, Oxford Economics to do for the whole of Scotland as well, but I think BPA have already provided those details to you. Anyone else? Yeah, we haven't. We, we have, we, we've done an economic uh, impact study, but it's based on the, the whole of Babcock in Scotland as opposed to what essentially the port might uh, sustain. Okay. Just to use the same format as Colin, um, our studies have shown that we contribute about 2.37 billion of GVA mm -hmm. through our ports, and the equivalent figure in terms of jobs is uh, 13,051. Okay. Mr. Patterson. In Montrose, the figures uh, are m much smaller, but uh, we certainly uh, comply with all the requirements, particularly when we're raising finance for developments, uh, both um, public sector finance and uh, r uh, borrowed finances. So we're all very conditioned to doing that for major projects. Okay. C can I ask you in turn um, to address the issue of infrastructure and how can you describe the current infrastructure surrounding your port and how well that serves uh, the port users and give me an indication, give the committee an indication of the levels of investment um, that are going into infrastructure at the moment? And over the, uh, the coming the coming years, where we go from from this end. Uh, annually, as a group, we invest roughly 30 million a year in our business directly, and about half of that goes into our Scottish ports, um, and that's direct capital investment as opposed to uh, anything that we spend in trading, health and safety, and other services. In terms of looking at projects and infrastructure requirements. 
I've mentioned the deepening in the new equipment at Grangemouth, so we would be earmarking at least 20 million plus for those kind of projects for Dundee, potentially up to 15 million in phase one uh, at Dundee, and another 10 to 20 million at Leith as we go forward. Um, we're all privately funded. Our shareholders effectively represent a number of different UK, Canadian and European pension funds. Um, we're securely financed and we have the capacity to invest in all the infrastructure improvements we're considering, um, which are all privately financed and which I believe is the right model for expanding a port's business. OK, Mr McGinley. In terms of uh, our investment uh, at Resyth, it's a combination of Babcock and up to now uh, MOD funding, and we've uh, <coughs> covered off a, a 1,000 tonne uh, Goliath crane. We've widened the uh, access, direct access to the port. We've also widened uh, one of the docks uh, to, to accept um, the aircraft carrier. Um, we've put a, a brand new pumping station in. We've uh, uh, put in modular transporters, a new forklift and crane fleet. Uh, we have now a, a traffic management and pedestrian safety initiative, which is um, a considerable um, amount of money as well. Um, and in terms of an 11 kV shore supply, we've put that in also. That kind of comes up to a total of about 100 million, of of least of which 40 to 45 million has been Babcock investment in Reside. Okay, Mr. Parker. Since the arrival of oil and gas in the North Sea about 50 years ago, we've virtually rebuilt the harbour. Uh, more recently, uh, we've spent about £33 million renewing the berths on the south side of the river. We spent £5.5 million deepening and widening our navigation channel. But there are many other projects in the, in the years before that. So, um, again, funded by, by ourselves, with no, with no borrowings, we've been able to virtually rebuild the harbour in that period. Any, any expansion plans? Well, the, the, the major expansion plan is the £320 million expansion into Nick Bay. And so that's, that's what uh, we're currently focused on at, at the moment. And we're down the, well down the road in our feasibility study. Hope to be in a position to make a decision sometime next year. Okay. Mr. Patterson. Um, in the last five years, um, we have firstly... Uh, invested in a project of £8 million pounds to uh, rebuild keys which had collapsed uh, in, on the south side of the harbour, for which we did get uh, significant grant assistance uh, through the freight facilities grant of £3 million. Pounds. Then, since that time, we have also been able to increase the trade to the extent that we've been able to build... Uh, or build a new berth, basically, on the, to, to replace uh, one that was in poor condition on the north side of the harbour. Um, that does uh, uh, cause us to have to, to borrow, but the, the, the business is such nowadays that we can afford to repay it. What, what's the figure for that? £8 million. Pounds. OK, thank you. Mike, you've got some questions. Uh, thank you, convener. We've heard of you know, some of the success areas... Um, you know, oil, obviously, oil and gas, whisky, another one. Um, but given the, just the variety of uh, cargo that's capable of being transported by sea, um, what areas do you feel um, maybe uh, where there is scope for improvement to, to, to uh, carry other cargoes by sea that are perhaps maybe not carried at the moment? Are you happy for me to lead off on that one? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things, when you look at Scotland's population, and, and, and we see this, um, it's interesting, we can contrast this with the port operations we run down south, where you have 25 million people virtually within an hour to an hour and a half's distribution, and ports tend to work on the basis of population. In Scotland, obviously, we only have something like two and a half, three million people in the central belt, five million people in total. So for me, it's important that we are exporting to punch above our weight. That means we have to give any industry in Scotland a tight supply chain, regular services and good infrastructure, as well as the possibility of logistics-related services. So for me, um, the type of thing we would look to do is to build... Um, there's a new term in our industry called port-centric distribution. All that really involves is trying to take uh, stock costs and distribution costs out the system for 
uh, industries who either want to export or import. So for us, uh, building warehouses and connecting those warehouses and facilities with the regular container services that we handle at Grangemouth, we have nine sailings a week at Grangemouth. So there's a very regular way of getting your goods to market to either Rotterdam, Antwerp, to Felixstowe, uh, or a number of other ports which can then distribute worldwide. So I would say it's an improvement of those kind of links uh, that are important for the industries in Scotland. Thank you. And any of the other gentlemen see any possibilities of expansion into new areas or increasing trade that goes out through our ports in general terms? As, as the oil and gas expertise in the northeast of Scotland grows and, and becomes better established, and the, the scope for the, the projects, like I've mentioned, the West Africa services, that's going around into uh, East Africa now as well and, and else, elsewhere in the world, that there's always scope for, for more of that to happen in the, in the future as well. But I would also endorse what Charles has said as well, providing better container services to stop the drift down to Felixstowe and Southampton where possible. Yeah, yeah. it's very encouraging to hear from Montrose that trade has doubled through the port. That, that, that's encouraging in a short period of time. Yes, well, well that's because it, um, we went out and marketed the facilities that we had after we'd improved them and that there was a need of marketing, uh, uh, I may say. Yeah. And now that uh, I've almost, com almost completed that job before I retire, <laughs> the, another marketing person can, can take over. But uh, just, just to say that, we have been successful in taking uh, lorries off the road, in persuading uh, importers, exporters to uh, operate by sea rather than by road. Yeah. 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 And we see that as an important element. Yeah, well, that's certainly a good note, note, note to retire on that, that kind of success. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think from, from Babcock, at a size point of view, we, we're, we're all about you know, finding innovative ways to move large structures around uh, that particular river and under uh, those three bridges that are going to be there now. And so, you know, the more, the, the more innovative we can be in that direction, then the more uh, work we're going to bring into to the facility. Yeah. And that's the real challenge, challenge for us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The, the, the committee has been, you know, undertaking a series of visits to ports to gain a bit of insight and understanding. And about a week ago, we were out at Fourth Ports in Greensmouth. And but to be honest with you, Mr. Hammond, I was really quite disappointed. Um, you know, we understand, we're led to believe that, you know, the kind of investment that there's been is two, three million a year over recent years. It looks to me like a third world facility. I was actually quite embarrassed. Um, surely um, the kind of order of investments that required is something more in the order that we're, we're, we're hearing proposed for Aberdeen. That's the kind of scale of investment that's required to make that port um, fit for purpose in, ten, in, in terms of competing with ports across the world and in other countries. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that, and I'm sorry you didn't get the right impression, because if you ask the customers at the container terminal... We're achieving productivity in excess of what Rotterdam are doing just now. In fact, regularly what happens at Grangemouth is the ships get turned round more quickly to make sure that they're back on schedule having been late from Rotterdam. So when you actually measure it with the things that really matter in a container terminal is not the appearance because you're looking at an industrial site. And Grangemouth, I would argue, is anything but a third world facility. Uh, we invest regularly in the equipment, the IT systems, and the cranage. And what really matters is productivity, turnaround times at the gate, and connectivity with the customer. And when you ask the customer what they're looking for, and that's why obviously we're investing to improve, you invest in a targeted way to make sure that the customer's business is being facilitated. So I would argue if you take any service standard, Grangemouth stands at the top of any service performance in that container terminal compared with even a number of the deep sea ports. So I think, for me, I completely agree with you. An ongoing commitment towards investment, an ongoing commitment towards improving systems and productivity. But at the moment, our customers are very happy with the service we provide. Yeah, well, 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 I mean, that's, that's an interesting explanation. And I noted that earlier that you mentioned the link that between kind of population. And obviously, Scotland's a pretty small country, so... Um, 
And it doesn't appear as if you feel that there's much possibility or that you have aspirations of expanding into other areas. And um, the population link is an interesting one because I've been led to believe in that, that the kind of uh, um, volume and value of trade that goes through at Forth Ports and Clyde Port um, is equivalent to uh, that that goes through Reykjavik and Iceland. And yet that's a country with a population much, much smaller than Scotland. And in fact, the volume of trade that goes through, again, those two main Scottish ports is about 10% or so of, of that that goes through Dublin and Belfast. So, you know, in that context, uh, w w would it be fair to say that you, you have a kind of lack of ambition for ex expanding Scotland's trade and that that might be a, a constraint on our economic growth? No, there's absolutely no lack of ambition. Uh, if there's a business there to be handled and we're out in the market uh, every day talking, talking to customers, the other thing to remember, of course, is that a lot of the trade between, uh, that goes out of Scotland actually finds its way down to England. So it's not going through the ports. It's actually been driven down. And where we need to think about, we need to think about taking that type of traffic off the road facilitating coastal shipping much more. So when you're measuring trade, I think you, it's always worth bearing in mind that England is still the largest trading partner that Scotland has. So in terms of ambition, uh, we want to grow our business. We've grown our business substantially over many, many years. I've been with Forth Ports for 25 years now, and uh, it's grown astronomically in terms of trade, um, financially, and in terms of investment. So I would certainly be happy to match anybody's ambition in what we want to do, whether it's in oil and gas, whether it's in chemicals, whether it's in whisky, or whether it's in emerging new industries. And I think the key here is to look at our trade patterns with England and look at how much we can bring back coastal shipping. We have a number of examples of coastal services just now. Um, the very small port of Kirkcaldy has been resurrected and uh, plays a very important part in the local economy now, all through a coastal shipping link uh, that we facilitated with Cars Milling, um, regular shipping service. So that's an example of the type of thing that can happen to get traffic off the road. Thank you. I mean, I'm still struggling to understand the kind of huge disparities in trade between other kind of countries that I think are more or less comparable. And I, I, I accept that geographically the... They're, they're perhaps not identical, but it seems to me to make much more sense to have more ambitious plans to take traffic off the road and make an investment that would facilitate that. If I could just maybe move on, though. Um, I, I, I think I've made my point that um, we're, we're ambitious and we want to take traffic off the road. And, you know, these other countries are islands effectively, and they have no other means of getting their goods out. So That's for right. I just me, want to make sure you feel you've had a fair hearing. Yep. Michael. So, um, you know, looking forward into the future then, can you anticipate any, any kind of changes in terms of, um, obviously, trade patterns will change, the type of commodities that may require to be transported and so on will change. So looking, looking forward into the future, um, you know, can you... Uh, uh, is there a degree of anticipation of future developments and future proofing in, in your investment plans? Again, if you... Oh, well, I mean, it's a more general question, but please feel free to, to lead uh, off. Very briefly, just again, we're constantly investing in new uh, management information systems, IT systems, and as a group we get the benefit of looking at best practice across the whole group to make sure that we are at the leading edge. You look at, uh, there's going to be a tendency towards greater automation. There's no doubt about that as we go forward. So when you looked at the straddle carriers at Grangemouth, if you go forward 10 years, my anticipation would be some of these will be automated and will be into automated stacking um, and information exchange will be instantaneous. When you look at how we manage ships in the river, uh, more and more are fitting transponders. So I think... Uh, Yes, there's a degree of anticipation in, in how we look at investment going forward, um, but ultimately investment has to result in greater productivity. One of the interesting things I would say to you is that the whole port sector, we did the, we had a look at this uh, as the UK major ports group, 
whole port sector has improved its productivity by 19% since the financial recession in 2008-2009. Just one final question, because I'm still a wee bit struggling with this point that, um, you know, we've heard that, you know, very, very ambitious plans in, you know, Aberdeen. I'm very glad to hear that. But Montrose, again, an £8 million investment pro rata to the size of port. That's a really quite considerable investment. And forgive me, Mr Hammond, if I feel that, you know, again, I'm just, what I'm trying to get at here, what concerns me is, is this private ownership model really serving us well in terms of providing you know, a modern facility with ambitious plans to increase our trade that flows through our ports. Do you feel that the model that you deal with, that you operate, is the best in terms of... Um, it's not really a criticism. We all operate under constraints. Yep. But if you can be objective, yep. um, do you really feel you could secure the necessary investment that you would ideally like to see so that that becomes a kind of model report that if the uh, port that if the committee were undertaking another visit five or ten years down the line, we would say, "Wow, Scotland's at the cutting edge of ports, not just in Europe but worldwide." I've been fortunate enough to be in this industry for a long time. So I've worked under a trust port setup. I've worked under a public company setup, and I've worked under a private company setup. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that. The best model, in my opinion, for expanding and growing the ports business is private ownership. There's absolutely no lack of finance. I talk about constraints. I don't have finance constraints. For the right projects, we can invest. The important thing that ports have to do, though, is because ports are facilitators, is we have to invest against market demand. We've had different models. If you look historically at the ports industry, when the ports industry invested in supply without thinking about demand, a number of the ports got into trouble. In fact, Fourth Ports was formed in the late 1960s because it was in financial trouble, all because of that supply-side investment. What really matters is you invest in concrete market demand and make sure that market demand is being met. And I'm sure you know, the, the projects we look at from time to time, whether it's 50 million, whether it's 20 million, whether it's 30 million, doesn't matter. The important thing is we're meeting a genuine market demand. And if I quote my 15 million a year, if I look at that over the last 10 years, that's at least 150 million pounds of investment across the piece. We could easily double that. We have the capacity to double it as long as there's a market demand for it. Thank you. Point. Yes. We just heard earlier from Mr. Patterson that Montrose have managed to, to double the traffic going through their per particular port with a combination of investment and marketing. Um, so uh, there is demand out there clearly for a well-run, efficient and uh, relatively low-cost uh, port facility. Now, I have a, a statement here from... Uh, an observer of the scene, he states that Scotland's major seaports are today self-regulating estuarial monopolies owned by offshore registered private equity funds, essentially looking after their own interest in charging economic rent uh, for their uh, port charges. And essentially the argument is because the way that the the port system is owned and regulated or not regulated, as the case might be. Uh, Scotland's ports are severely underdeveloped and we should uh, be uh, establishing a, a maritime transport policy to address that particular issue. So how would you, how would you respond to that, that criticism of your operations, uh, Mr Hamm? Can we just make the um, witnesses aware of who that statement comes from. Okay. Um, okay. You want to do that, Kevin? Yeah. A, 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 there's a submission we received from Professor Alfred Baird, who is Professor of Maritime Business Transport at the Transport Research Institute of Edinburgh Napier University. I, I mean, I won't make any comment. I, I know Alf Baird well, and I think we we've all known Alf over the years. Um, I don't think that's a particularly well-informed view of our business. And I suppose it must be aimed at our business because we're probably the one private owner. I can't imagine it's aimed at, at Babcock. 
Um, all I would say is we're owned by infrastructure funds. Those infrastructure funds represent pensions that everyday people invest in. And what those people are interested in is effectively investing in assets that mature in the long term and give stability. And our business has grown consistently over the years since I've been there. I mean, I, uh, if I give you an indication of values, and this has come through investment, Fourth Ports floated in the stock exchange in 1992 with a value of 30 million and a limited capital base. It now has an enterprise value of over a billion pounds and doesn't have constraints in terms of its investment. So I come back to the fact that, unfortunately, I think Professor Baird is a fan of this just invest and they will come philosophy. And I'm afraid my view is you have to look at genuine market demand and then you invest to meet that demand. And as long as you have the financial capacity to do that, and our shareholders are incredibly supportive of any investment plans that we bring forward to the board. I've never had a proposition for investment ever turned down by the Board of Fourth Ports. So I suppose that's a general response. We remain committed to investing in all our ports to improve the facilities and to improve services to our customers. Okay. Yes, Mr Parker. Yeah, it breaks my heart to be nice to Charles, but I could maybe <laughs> take some attention <laughs> off him. But, um, you asked about change, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr McKenzie, but um, the reason we're looking at Nick Bay is because our uh, traffic is changing because the vessels are getting bigger. Um, there's the offshore renewable sector, which, which several of us are, are looking at in, in the future. The uh, decommissioning prize out there is estimated between 30 and 40 billion pounds. So that, that's a major prize, which if, if ports on the east coast of Scotland don't invest in, then that will drift away to Norway or, or further south in the UK. And, and so we're, with the centre of excellence around West Hill, uh, where most of the oil, um, oil and gas dive support expertise is based, then th there's pressure on us to provide more berths for the, for the larger vessels that are associated with that. There's also a tremendous prize out there, which Charles is already handling uh, in a much larger scale than, than we're doing, is the cruise vessels, because the North Sea is seen as being a very safe um, destination to, to go to. So we, we have Royal D side, we have the castles, we have distilleries, we have Trump Golf, which is already generating quite a bit of interest in, in, in Aberdeen, as, but we don't have the capacity for that size of vessel that is really looking at. So we're, we're adapting to the change that we, we see is already coming. But we had 23 vessels at anchor off the harbour yesterday morning. And, and so the, the, there is demand for capacity already, and that's what we're looking to, to adapt for. If I could just come back and uh, convene on that, because I think you raise a very interesting point, and I absolutely applaud the investment that you're making. Um, the, in terms of decommissioning work, you'll be aware that some other ports, you know, Lerick, for instance, is an interest in that, I think WIC has too. Um, is there a need for a kind, some kind of strategic view of that, though, uh, to, to overcome the kind of danger that different uh, facilities are making investments um, that compete with each other, when perhaps it may be best to concentrate some or all of that activity you know, at specific ports that are best placed, rather than making duplication and um, introducing too much competition, competition into yeah. that decommissioning market? I think the, the decommissioning market will, will select the, the most appropriate port for the, the type of activity that they want to do. Like Lerwick has a, a very large area for cutting up large topsides. That's not something that you would want to do in Aberdeen. Um, but it's the subsea related activity that, that is involved in. I heard it described as doing all the plumbing work before you start taking away large structures offshore because they're all interrelated. So there's a lot of pipe work on the subsea wellheads and things where you don't need necessarily the facilities that Lurick are looking at specializing in uh, to a greater extent. So there's, there's such a wide variety of uh, requirements, then I don't see any reason why um, it should all happen in one particular port, because there is such a wide variety uh, of expertise required for the various aspects of the work involved. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Of course, yeah. 
James, you've got some questions. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Uh, just uh, uh, follows on from what uh, Mike just said there. Now, is there sufficient competition between the Scottish ports to obtain the best results for customers and therefore the Scottish economy? I believe there's a fair amount of competition out there. We, we, um, we do compete with each other. An, an awful lot of what you do on the, on the agricultural side tends to be you have your own hinterland which you support, but there are other aspects of the activity that we compete on. Yeah, I believe there's a fair amount of competition there. I mean, it is geographical in the first place. Um, you have to save uh, um, road transportation costs. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the importer or exporter will look at the closest port first, but then see what facilities there are um, on the shore side to accommodate the import or export. So we all get our share. So, so when you, you're uh, making investment decisions, it's not based around competition against your... your well, it can be. It, it can be, but it would then depend upon volumes uh, and... And uh, what type of facilities are required? If you can build facilities that can serve several different types of trade, so much the better. If it's very specialised, you may only have one customer for it. Okay. So it's a, it's a mix. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Thank you. No? Okay. Uh, the, one of the issues that's come up a number of times is the additional cost of repositioning empty containers for Scottish shippers. Have you observed any change in this? And uh, if it still is an issue, can you identify any likely so solutions? Um, perhaps I can make one or two comments. Empty repositioning is always difficult, and it's something we would always want to encourage because that obviously facilitates exports. For me, this is where the coastal shipping links are quite important. Trying to get cargo back into Scotland as well. Uh, we're looking at this and trying to link Tilbury up with Grangemouth at the moment so that we have containers in Scotland to take advantage of exports. Obviously, the difficulty is a lot of the lines will run containers up by road, which is not a particularly good um, or cost-effective solution. So that's where I think regular coastal shipping uh, can come in to, to help that situation. How do you go about facilitating or encouraging that, then? Well, we look at linking customers up. We've got a number of customers who use our facilities in the London area and who have a Scottish business as well. So uh, what we look at doing is perhaps they will then bring in something like, for example, plywood for the construction market. A lot of it comes into the South East. Some of it is really can come up to Scotland. So we then look at some of those plywood um, shipments which are in containers, then linking up with feeder ships, which will then run between, say, Tilbury and Grangemouth, but they also call up the East Coast. So they'll They'll call it Immingham, they'll call it Teesport, they'll triangulate with Rotterdam, um, and then the boxes find their way up to uh, Grangemouth. Sometimes it's a mixture of empty and full boxes. That type of thing is the kind of link we would encourage. And are you having any success in, in growing that, that market? Yes, we are. It's a question, though, of getting, I suppose, what they call critical mass. You know, that's the difficulty with the coastal shipping, is you have to have a certain amount of cargo from from the start to make the service viable. So it's a case of getting several customers together with the feeder line to uh, to try and put that type of proposition together. So a bit of early success, but something we're working at more and more with the links between the two ports. And uh, can I just ask yourself, Mr Hammond, before I go on to the others, uh, is there one specific thing that you can think of that you could do that would or, or that could be done that would uh, help to improve this? I, I think a clearer system uh, of support for coastal shipping would help. I think we have coastal shipping. We don't have it on the scale that perhaps we should be. Um, you have to look at the, the whole question, not of just of the economics, but also the carbon emissions as well. Okay. okay. Uh, does anybody else have any comment on Mr Patterson? Uh, no, we're not involved in containers. Uh, at Montrose, so we don't have that type of problem. Okay. 
Mr Parker. Yeah, we're on a much smaller scale than Charles and a very different style of, of traffic. The, the, the containers that we handle are specifically uh, linked with the lines that operate. So the West Africa services have their own containers which they bring in themselves and what have you. Uh, Streamline up to the Northern Isles has their own containers. Sea Cargo, twice weekly freight ferry to uh, Norway, they have their own containers. So it's not the same. We did have a feeder service many years ago and that was a major challenge. But I'm not sure whether the ports are the answer to the issue about um, repositioning of containers. It's the shipping companies that you need to talk to there. But that, that's my understanding of it. Ports facilitate this by providing the space to store these containers, but it's, it's the shipping lines that are the people involved in repositioning them. That's a fair point. The, Mr Parker talked earlier on about the increasing size of container vessels, uh, and how does that affect the ability of the Scottish ports to serve the Scottish trade? You, you, as I say, you already touched on it. Uh, the, the vessels I was talking about changing are the subsea di dive support okay. vessels and subsea construction vessels, and... and to a certain extent, cruise vessels get bigger all the, all the time as well. But uh, container vessels, I think Charles is probably the person to speak to. The size of feeder vessels in the last eight years has just about doubled. Uh, and obviously you see the very large, ultra-large container vessels that are being handled for Maersk, China Shipping and a number of the other deep sea lines. So the reason we're doing the deepening at Grangemouth, at the moment we're fine. Uh, there's no problem with the size of feeder vessels we're currently handling, but we anticipate in the future those feeder vessels will get larger. And as we move towards feeder sizes of probably 1,800 to 2,000 TEUs, we need to do the deepening uh, and improve capacity at Grangemouth. So that's why we've, we've got that in our investment plans. So you're already investing to deepen to take on these future <coughs> vessels then? Yes. Thanks very much. The last thing then is, uh, what impact do you anticipate from the introduction of the SECA regulations? Um, and on the oil and gas industry, they were predominantly using the, the fuels that people are now required to use anyway uh, for the modern supply vessels were well ahead of the game there. The impact on... <laughs> stands for Sulphur Sorry. Emission Control Area. Those hundreds of thousands will be delighted that you said that. So the, the impact in Aberdeen has been minimal. Uh, probably the biggest impact has been on the uh, Circo Northlink Ferry, um, subsidised by the Scottish Government. So they had to change from a much lower grade of fuel to the, the new grade. Presumably, I haven't spoken to anybody, but presumably the drop in oil price has, has helped them significantly in addressing that, in, in, uh, that impact. But they would be better advised to, to tell you about that. <coughs> Does anybody else have any comment? I would agree with that point. And I think it, it has fortunately, we lobbied against this regulation because we felt it was discriminatory, um, because it only applies around the East Coast rather than the West Coast at the moment. Um, it has meant that the ferry companies across the UK have had to put on surcharges because of these regulations, but fortunately, in a way, it has also coincided with a lower fuel price because of the oil price, but we don't know whether that will continue. So it is a surcharge. Clearly, the surcharge is greater uh, the more you're at sea. So that means that, for example, for the Rosyth Sea Brugge Ferry Services, um, comparatively at a disadvantage when you look at the services that go through Teesport to Zeebrugge, Hull to Zeebrugge, or even Tilbury to Zeebrugge, the surcharge is less. So for us, it's had a disproportionate effect, and that's why we're working with the Scottish Government and with DFDS to try and make sure there's a long-term future for that ferry service at Rosyth. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else get any comment on it? No? Okay, thank okay, you Thank much. you, um, Alex. Thank you, convener. Uh, I wanted to talk about the issue of land access uh, to ports. Now, I know uh, Aberdeen and Montrose well, and I know that Aberdeen is at certain times of the day surrounded by one big traffic jam. Uh, I know that Montrose has other problems uh, with tight access in some places and uh, poor quality, let's say, access to the trunk road network. But in general terms, uh, what do you think of the road access that you have to your port facilities and is there need for improvement in that? Certainly from, uh, from our perspective, um, it's something that, that we use as a USP at Rosyth because of the fact that you know, we are near the bridge, we are near the railway, we, do, we are near the, the, the airport, um, therefore 
you know, for us bringing, uh, bringing people in, for instance, um, doing crew changes for Aberdeen, we actually use that as a, as a selling point because, you know, guys are coming in from the south or from the north are coming into straight off the, off the main trunk routes into, into the side. So for us, it's a, we see that as a benefit. And obviously, this new bridge coming in, we'll see that as a further benefit. Certainly, in terms of Aberdeen, it, it's challenging. Uh, Market Street is is, um, is certainly challenging since the opening of the um, Union Square shopping centre, an unfortunate conversion of a rail freight yard. Um, but um, <laughs> one of the attractions that we feel that Nig Bay offers is that we, you have a road to the south, potential links into another industrial estate at East Tullus. So we are working with our local authority and regional transport partnership to look at how that can be developed. I think in terms of a National Planning Framework 3 project, then I think some more support for that would be a, an advantage to, to address that. But a big selling point for Nick Bay would be to be clear of the city centre in Aberdeen. I think David Whitehead, when he gave evidence to you, mentioned this, uh, the last mile of road into the port. And I think that's a very good concept. We've seen, um, I would back up what David said about Resyth. Uh, we obviously operate the port at Resyth, and Fife Council invested in the Spine Road, which is a direct link from the M90. Very good investment. It has definitely helped. Dundee Council have also invested in uh, helping us with a new entrance. We've also invested in this uh, to the east end of the port at Dundee, which has helped with both the renewables and the North Sea oil and gas market. But there are a couple of areas in our ports, certainly... Good, good road links into Grangemouth, but the Avon Gorge is a, one area where we feel access to the west could be improved, and particularly at Leith, where the roads in Edinburgh, as you'll know yourselves, are pretty congested, and that last mile into the port is a very important one. Leith is still uh, a key facility, and the east coast of Scotland and its road links um, are really uh, somewhat on a par with what Colin has described for Aberdeen. Does Montrose have specific problems? <clears throat> no, you're very familiar with the layout of it. I mean, uh, there are uh, one. The, the south side has not got a problem because mm -hmm. the A92 passes right by its gateway. Um, but on the north side, you, you've got to still to go through the town, where a lot of activity still happens. And uh, there have been uh, schemes devised, as I think you're aware, in the past by consultants. But the consultants and their uh, researchers uh, visited many lorry drivers. They went in to the cabs of lorries, leaving or coming to the port, and discovered that the lorry drivers themselves were quite contented with the road systems. So that took uh, a bit of the steam out of it. I've been in a car that met one of these lorries. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's not a major problem for us. The, in terms, uh, we've had evidence from uh, some people who are not represented here today relating to uh, access to the trunk road network and the trunk road network itself. Uh, are there any issues, uh, for instance, I notice uh, that Fourth Ports mentioned the uh, Avon Gorge uh, access to Grangemouth. Uh, are there any issues about the, the broader road network that you're concerned about in terms of access to ports? Nothing that I haven't just already mentioned. Yeah, as well, as as there, there's unfinished work, as you're very aware, between uh, uh, Arbroath and Montrose. Mm -hmm. um, um, but hopefully that will be rectified in the not-too-distant future. Yeah. It's not a major problem for us, the road access to the port. Mm -hmm. In terms of rail access, uh, there is uh, a lot said about uh, getting traffic onto the rails, but as you mentioned a moment ago, up until a few years ago, there was a large good yard, good yard at Aberdeen and even tracks leading onto the quays in some places, and all that has been lost. Well, the, the tracks were, were no longer uh, connected to the, the quays when, when they went away, but we, at the time, Aberdeen Harbour viewed it as a, a, a loss but there was not significant traffic at all passing through those uh, through that rail freight yard at the time. But in terms of integrated transport, we, we didn't believe it was the, the right move, and we thought building a shopping centre may cause problems, and, and that's been proved. 
we've invested in our own rail freight facilities on the north side of the harbour and the calcium carbonate slurry that I mentioned earlier on does leave the harbour area um, by, by that rail connection. Also in East Tullus, which Nig Bay could link into, not by rail but by a road, road link, we believe that we could enhance the, the facilities at Craig Inch's rail freight. So there is potential for rail freight there, but I think there are serious challenges in the infrastructure and the rail network to be addressed before freight is a serious option for the, for the freight sector. What, other facili what facilities do the others have uh, to access rail? We have rail uh, siding facilities at Grangemouth and I think for us it is quite important that those rail paths for freight which are reasonably good are maintained and interestingly one or two of our customers um, have experimented in the past with short haul rail. It has always been um, an accepted wisdom that rail only works over longer distances but actually it can work in a very complementary way on a short haul basis with road transport as well so companies like Malcolm's. Uh, are using that quite effectively uh, into Grangemouth. I think the other thing we would want to, to see preserved is the rail link we also enjoy into the port of Rosyth, which, although not being used extensively at the moment, obviously has the potential to be used in the future. Mm -hmm. Do Bob Cox use that same, have access to yeah, that same? Absolutely. Rail link? It's, it's the same, same position for us, but right now it's not something that we, we are concerned about. Can you see the potential of using that more effectively in future? Um, where, where we are just now, as I said before, you know, we, as an engineering company, you know, we're more focused on putting things over the, over the jetty and into the mm -hmm. sea. Um, bringing, uh, bringing you know, for instance, bringing uh, aircraft carrier uh, from the various uh, other yards in, uh, in the UK has primarily been done by sea or, mm -hmm. or by road. Um, there's been no real real link at all because of the, the network down south effectively mm -hmm. it was looked at yeah uh, Montrose of course is a, a station nearby is it an effective part well of seven the years ago Scotrail uh, invested quite heavily in the goods yard that they have uh, I've never seen a train in it though <laughs> and uh, the types of commodities which we are moving in and out of Montrose, don't lend themselves well to uh, transfer by rail anyway. The, the, the question I have written here is, uh, and I'll ask it, um, although it doesn't seem to apply to the answers I've given, is there any way that the uh, rail facilities that you have access to is limiting your capacity? Not you don't feel no. you're being limited by it at the moment? No. I think you have to bear in mind that ports may well view rail as a com competitor as well. So um, unless you actually own the facility and generate revenue from there, then... But I, I think the rail infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier on, the network is challenged enough as it is without focusing on just ports alone. Mm. I was I was going to ask you... Uh, that inspires a question. Uh, I was going to ask you, you know, what are the, the obstacles to the free throw of rail uh, to Scottish <coughs> ports uh, and what improvements might remove these obstacles? Now, I'm sure the question was drafted in terms of physical obstacles, but uh, are we perhaps looking at a situation where there may be a regulatory or a, a competitive problem that's uh, driving a wedge between the rail and the, the shipping industry and the ports? I said we, we have invested in a, in a rail uh, yard to the north of the, uh, the harbour, put two additional sidings in, and there are two sidings used by the, the slurry people. So we've invested in it, but the interest is, is, is minimal. Um, there was initially some cargo flows um, from down in England with some base oil, but that, that dried up a few years ago. So because of the, the challenges of the network, that we're not aware of any serious uh, interest in it. So we're looking at a situation where access to rail is there, but it's not being used a great deal. Is that fair to say? I, th I think that's a reasonable point, actually. It's being used to a certain extent, but I think we would want to keep the freight connectivity we have. I mean, the point Colin made about competition is, is also well made because you look at the container market... There is a lot of competition there. We compete not just with Greenock and the West Coast and some of the uh, ports like Teesport and Tyne, but also with Freightliner. Now, we have a perfectly good relationship with Freightliner because we work with them. We're their landlord down in Tilbury. 
So it's a kind of multifaceted relationship. So I don't think it gets in the way of any potential, but obviously there is there is competition there as well. Thank you. Yeah, it was just a, a, a clarification from Mr Hammond. I mean, did, did I hear you say that you intend to invest in completing that, you know, or, or installing that last half mile or so of, of rail that would take rail provision right down to the quayside, as it were, in Grangemouth? That, that's did a, I misunderstand that? Or? Yeah, I, I, I didn't say that right, uh, to, to my recollection, but there is the potential to increase the capacity of rail, certainly at Grangemouth, and if the demand's there, that's something. We have looked at that as part of the feasibility of linking up and expanding capacity and building new warehouses, because the other possibility, of course, is that we can have rail-linked warehouses within the port. So there is, there is a scheme that would look at doing that. Uh, so I, I certainly wouldn't rule it out, but we haven't started in doing that at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mary. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning. Um, and I wanted to ask a bit more about short sea and ferry transport. Now, a lot of what I'm going to ask you has been covered already, but you may feel you want to expand slightly. Now, all the UK deep sea container ports are located in England, and Resythe Zeebrugge is the only ferry service in Scotland. It's an international ferry service, and there's a lot of um, lorry traffic comes through the, the roll-on, roll-off ferry on, on the west coast through the ports to Ireland. Um, now, it's already been mentioned that there is a feeling that the Resythe Zeebrugge line is running at a disadvantage. There are access and storage is issues um, particularly at Resythe, we've mentioned the SICA, the SICA regulations. Is there anything in particular that could be done to make ferry operations from Scotland more sustainable um, and, and to help to increase cargo destined for Europe? Anything you've not mentioned? I, I think I'd, just, I'd also put the, the ferry service in the context of all the short sea services that I see going to Europe. I think that's quite important. So. Um, we've got a frequency of three times a week from Resythe to Zeebrugge, but as well as that, we've got nine calls a week at Grangemouth. Now, if you look at the total number of units that the current ferry service is handling, it's about 39,000 units, which includes about 11,000 trade cars and 21,000 containers. Now, the alternative route for these containers obviously would be through Grangemouth with the frequency. So the trailer use of the ferry, I think the frustrating thing um, for both ourselves and the Scottish Government is that the hauliers haven't made greater use of uh, the ferry service for trailer traffic. It's a kind of catch-22 situation. You need better frequency to do that. But even when there was better frequency, it wasn't used as well as it needed to be. So there is a difficulty there. But if you look at the total mix of business there, I think um, what we're aiming to try and do is a long-term sustainable future. And the Scottish Government themselves are looking at the feasibility of whether a, a new compliant LNG vessel could be built and operated in that route. And we very much support something like that, um, something that could be worked in partnership with the government and also the operator. That was really the purpose behind the MOU we entered into late last year. OK, thank you. Anyone else? Can I just point out, we have a twice-weekly international ferry to Norway as well. So, mm -hmm. Recite Zeebrugge isn't the only international ferry service in Scotland. Okay. And, and is, that, is that quite a successful operation? Are you planning to expand that? Or is there anything in particular that could be done to make that more sustainable? Well, they've increased in the last 12 months from once a week to twice a week. So, uh, although that was really to address some competition that came in from a, another service that linked us with... Um, Norway and round into Russia at Mamansk, uh, which has now uh, ceased operating. But so it's it's a successful service. It's been established for about 30 years, um, linking um, Aberdeen with, with West Coast uh, Norway. So um, I think that what I would suggest that uh, there's for many years now there's been talk of short sea shipping. The most difficult part of that is pronouncing it. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask you that next. So you but um, I, I think... This is a family show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I got it right. The, um, the, I think the, the big thing there is putting your money where your mouth is and, and saying if you want to promote shipping, then the government should be looking at doing more to, to, to go out there and speak to people who, so who are exporting. To short sea. Yes, yes, coastal, yeah. as, as Charles said, and, and continental and, and, and Norway and the likes. And, and get out there and talk to people about it. 
to support the, the shipping industry. And, and there are grants available, freight facilities mm. grants and the likes. It's, it's quite a, a sort of a maze to get through some of these things. So if, if, if the government's serious about doing it, then get out there and promote it. Get, mm. put, put people on the road talking to exporters. But would that also mean a, a simplification of the grant scheme then? If you say it's, it's a maze, I know, I know um, my colleague's going to cover that a bit more. Um, I, I believe, I believe that I'm not an expert on, on mm. the grant um, system. I have enough trouble with Sudoku, but uh, <laughs> I believe I believe that that is something that that, that could be made simpler. John or yeah, uh, we, we have no ferry services, mm. despite the, the South Quay being in ferry mm. den. Uh, the ferry is long since gone, but but the short sea shipping is a very important element of our trade there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it, it, it works quite well, actually. So how, how do you promote that? Um, we promote it amongst our existing users, and when we're marketing to people who are not our users, um, we just mention the fact that short sea shipping uh, is yeah. what <laughs> is, is the business that we are in. And, and that uh, we think that we're quite good at it, and that the short sea shippers themselves are good at it. <laughs> Just showing off now, John. <laughs> I'm going to trip up. I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> so. And how, how do you pr promote that in, in Ports Down South? What promotion do you do? How do you work with, with partner ports? We tend... We tend not to have a, a, a close relationship with, with partner ports. But, um, we all know each other anyway. Yeah. And, and if there is to be a benefit in uh, um, colluding with, a, with another you would do that. port, we would do it mm -hmm. uh, informally. Mm. Yeah. But the, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the marketing of the movement of the commodities mm -hmm. uh, is not uh, uh, part of our front line. It's the actual importers and exporters who do that. We often help them. Mm -hmm. okay. I think you've made a very good point there, though, that the links mm. for the short sea shipping market are very important, and mm. the feeder market. So, for example, developments like the mass flat at Rotterdam mm -hmm. is very important because if you get congestion in Rotterdam, very often that's what will frustrate Scottish exporters mm. in getting their goods to market. So... You know, building links, we, we know the port of Rotterdam, the major terminal operators at the Mass Flat, mm. similarly Antwerp, Zeebrugge, as well as mm -hmm. uh, Hutchison down at Felixstowe, for example. So I think um, that is an important initiative to, to make sure that there is always capacity for the feedership at the major terminals to make that link mm -hmm. work. And I think there is more that can be done in that. OK, thank you. David, I don't know, do you have any... Uh, triple S is uh, something we don't engage in, I'm afraid. <laughs> Very clever. Very clever. Well, going last has its advantages. <laughs> no, it's not something we're involved in. OK, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you, um, David. Uh, thank you, convener. Could I ask the witnesses what your experience is of using freight uh, grant schemes, such as freight facilities grants? Mr Hammond? Yes. I, I mean, we successfully received uh, one or two freight facilities grants and so of our customers. I would say the system is complex, difficult to uh, understand. I think I'm, I'm probably on a par with Colin when it comes to Sudoku. And wow. uh, I, I have to say th th this, the whole system could be made simpler and more transparent would be my view. Um, I feel sorry for the people who have to administer mm. these schemes. Mm. So I, I think definitely uh, there's a case for greater simplicity. And if we could have it, greater support for the services that start up. Mm. It's not always about you can build the infrastructure on either side. And in fact, we're quite happy to do that for sustainable services. There's no problem mm. with that. I think it's looking at the viability, especially in those first six months to nine months of getting mm. enough cargo mm. um, for a coastal service, short sea service, that's where the, the scheme, I think, could be targeted. Hmm. And, I mean, there has been some really good examples uh, of the grant. For example, if I can mention the Highlands and Islands uh, issue the, for the Waterborne Freight Grant, Boyd Brothers and um, Haulage and Corpac uh, got nearly a million pounds. 
and the amount of journeys that's equivalent for HGVs was 6,300, which is phenomenal. Uh, I know particularly in, in my patch in Highlands Islands, there's obviously real constraints on road uh, and real constraints on rail. Um, and as we had in the debate yesterday, convener, uh, it's not just the single track capacity, particularly mm. for haulage, it's a height issue. Um, so I think there's great potential for this modal shift. But I was surprised, and perhaps the witnesses could correct this as if it was wrong, of the three different grants, if you look at the main one, Freight Facilities Grant, I'm, I'm told that there's been no awards since 2011, which certainly surprised me. I mean, is, is that correct? Is that the experience? I know from intros we heard that, uh, that there was a Freight Facilities Grant. Um, is that a correct figure, that there's been no awards made since 2011? I'm not sure about the, the, the date, but I know there's not been any interest in it for quite a while. But I, I'm, whether that's the complexity or, or just it's too much effort to, 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 it, to be involved in that, I don't know. Because obviously I'm speaking to the prejudice of my audience, because clearly witnesses are very keen on this, as I am. But obviously the wider picture is that the government's got very strict climate change targets, and this is an ideal way to try and reduce it, emissions. But the fact there's been no awards made since 2011 for that specific grant seems really surprising. Mr. Patterson, you mentioned, I think, you were yes, successful. Yes, th th thank you. Um, the freight facilities grant uh, that we were awarded was completed in, in 2011. And when we came to the next phase uh, of construction, which wasn't dissimilar, we were, we were really prevented from uh, applying for it because we had used up road mileage savings from all the keys in, in the port. I, I mean, uh, part of my process was to persuade the uh, officials concerned that we were, we were looking at the whole harbour whilst only um, repairing two which had collapsed into the sea. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because they were part of the team of all the berths, if mm -hmm. you like. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. So I used it up. <laughs> Sure. Uh, because because it's complex, right. uh, just as you've suggested. Yeah. So in, um, in, I'm now thinking of doing it again. But uh, right. uh, could you explain, perhaps, to the committee then, in relative terms, how complicated it is the application? Is it, uh, does it stop chief execs throughout Scotland making up? Yes, yes, it can do. Right. And the only reason that I was really successful was that uh, we got a knock on the door one day from. Uh, a bunch of farmers who said, we want that site over there, adjacent to this quay, to uh, build a new grain terminal. Right. So when we took the throughput, proposed throughput of the grain terminal and took all the road miles that it mm. would save mm. from taking grain down to Berwick mm. or mm. wherever, there was a huge road mileage saving that we were able yeah. to get the grant on. Now, that's not easy to do. Sure. That was a stroke of luck. I mean, did you find that you um, needed to bring in outside consultants who are experts oh, yes. in this? Right. Yes. And that's a cost to you as well? Cause you oh, yes, to yes. It. But it was a worthwhile cost. Sure. And, and, and the, also, the group of farmers who had built the yeah. grain terminal also got a grant with the same set of consultants. Sure. And, and they were from down south. Was the fee for the consultant something you could claim against freight facility grant? No. So that was a direct cost to your business? Uh, it was a direct cost, but it was also a bonus. Okay. Is that yeah. Mr. Parker? Uh, if, if, if a grant has been in place for the last three or four years that hasn't been used, then marketing would appear to be the, yes. the challenge. Yes. If we built a key and nobody came, yeah. then we would market it sure. and chase it. Yeah. But to criticise, and I'm not suggesting that they, they were saying that, but, but to, to almost criticise an industry for not using a grant then there's something wrong with sure. the system, yeah. isn't there? Sure. I can certainly see some parliamentary questions uh, coming out of this uh, debate, but I, I was really surprised that this one major element had not been utilised for many, many years. And I had some experience, again, with the local example of um, I, in, in the Gordons, I think it was, in uh, Nern, who, as you know, is a timber processing firm. Yeah. They utilised it to bring timber from Sky uh, into the port in, in Nern, which I think was an excellent example of it. Um, but I'm really quite concerned that we're not utilising this grant that, that is there. And it's still, uh, it's still available and open, but as far as I can work out, it's not been used. Mr Parker, did you have a uh, well, We, we, we uh, provided the contact details. We, we got them from Transport Scotland. We provided that to a customer just recently, but I'm not sure if they've actually pursued that. Right. So, Mr Parson, I cut you off midstream. I would say, as a Highlander myself, uh, I would say that, that the Highlands have always been uh, 
more favoured from from grant systems than than the rest of us in the ports I'm talking about. Right. And uh, uh, thereby, but when I managed the port of Peterhead for almost 20 years before I mm. retired and then went to Montrose, and there I was chasing fish-related grants, which was an awful lot easier, European funding, uh, than anything else that I've encountered in other ports. I suppose it's all relative, because certainly I've heard they're very hard to get as well. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr McGinley, do you have any experience? In this no, area? we, we um, have not looked at freight grants in any uh, way at all. We, we have engaged in, in other areas for uh, building uh, type grants elsewhere with Scottish Enterprise and been reasonably successful uh, uh, and haven't found that element in that area too difficult. And I suppose the wider question is, apart, that, apart from the grant schemes which we've talked about over the last few minutes, do you, do you feel there's a drive within the sector itself to move more freight uh, away from road to water? Mr Hammond? I would say it needs to be encouraged and facilitated. Uh, I, I suspect some of the issues about freight facilities grants as well, it, it's not just about accessibility. There's always the difficulty or suspicion that the grant is going to be used really just to move one piece of business from one location to another, whereas the examples you've given are really sort of genuine examples of mm. the fact that uh, you're moving from, from road on to sea. Mm. So I think there is that inherent suspicion. So I, I would say that the grants themselves have to be made simpler. They have to be targeted more towards the ship owner as well. And I agree with Colin's point, they need to be marketed better. Mm. And I, I don't think this is just a problem in Scotland. I see it also in the UK as well. Mm. Mm. I mean, there, there obviously are um, uh, UK-wide schemes, and there's obviously cooperation between the UK Department of Transport and Transport Scotland on this, but it is a bit of a concern that, as I said, we're not utilising the, the existing grants better. Do any other witnesses have any other comments? I, I don't believe there's a strong drive for certain parts of... Um, freight industry to, to put stuff by sea. We are at an advantage. There's no roads out to the rigs and the platforms in the North Sea. There's no roads to the Northern Isles or Norway. So we're in a, in a, in a you know, beneficial position there. Mm. But I think there, there's an awful lot of... It's very easy to put freight on a, on a road and truck it south. Mm. It's, it's the, and I think that some of the points made earlier about the uh, tonnages passing... Uh, to Belfast and Dublin is simply because it's an island mm -hmm. and, and you have to get it that way and mm -hmm. the point that Charles made about so much of it goes down by road down into England or vice versa mm -hmm. is, is, is what we're competing against there. Mm -hmm. I think also my, my experience again use that high example I was at Ferguson's Transport in Corpac which some of you may be aware of yeah, yeah. and because they're integrated in the sense that they have sea interests and port interests yeah. and haulage that they're much more interested in transferring to to see, no, but you know, few companies have that integration. Yeah. Any other points that we've not covered on this particular issue? Right, thank you, Convener. Uh, James, you had a point. Uh, yes, I'd just like to come in, in briefly on the, the modal shift grants. I mean, I take it that the witnesses are pleased that modal shift grants were retained in Scotland when they, when they weren't retained in England, but can I ask what representations uh, have been made by the industry to the government to uh, clarify and simplify the, the the freight facilities grant, if it is uh, as it appears to be so difficult to to get to. I, other than the recent referral to a, a, a customer about the freight facilities grant, um, it's not something we've had spent any time on at all. I think the, the industry bodies have certainly both the UK Major Ports Group and British Ports Association have made those representations. How, how the last time they did them, I'm not aware of, but they, they have regularly made those representations. Okay, well. I think it would be worth making again. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been yeah, successful yeah, in getting them, and, and I think that if others are uh, straying away from them, the reasons ought to be sussed out. Okay, we'll look at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Adam. Right, uh, um, I'd like to, t to get some. Uh, feedback from yourselves with regards to reducing Scotland's carbon footprint, uh, particularly with the water freight uh, industry. Uh, how can you make a contribution to doing that? And 
perhaps you might want to refer to the uses of technology um, and how they might be applied to your particular industry. I think one, if, if I can kick off with one, I always find this quite an interesting statistic. We emit about, as a group, 40,000 tonnes of carbon a year in providing services, and we save, we believe, the UK economy, when we've looked at this, more than 12 times that amount. Right. And it comes back to our friend short sea shipping. Um, more of that will certainly reduce carbon emissions, but there are other technologies. I mean, we're looking all the time at LED lighting, um, more fuel-efficient engines, um, technology which limits emissions, that, that type of thing. We have a sort of standing environmental group within Fourth Ports which looks at what we're doing at Tilbury, what we're doing in Scotland, and combines best practice. And uh, I think we're pretty successful even when we're in years of growth in limiting carbon emissions, but that modal shift could do more than anything. Taking that traffic off the road, uh, going down to England, will do more than anything to reduce those emissions. There's an argument, obviously, about where those emissions are happening, depending on the length of the road journey, but it's still a good thing to do. Okay. I would echo that sentiment and um, say that Babcock do exactly the same type of, take, take, take the same type of approach to, to trying to reduce our carbon footprint at any any opportunity. Okay. Same, same at Aberdeen Harbour. We've fitted some LED, LED lighting and we're, we're looking to do more. I think ports should be viewed as facilitators for, for addressing um, the carbon issue. Uh, there, there's the, I would describe it as the long-held myth about cold ironing, as the Americans call it, shore power onto vessels. That very much depends on the type of vessel that you um, operate, is operating through your port, because a lot of the vessels in, in Aberdeen Harbour are using cranes and winches whilst they're alongside. And we'd black out Aberdeen, I think, if we tried to plug somebody into that. And there isn't the, there isn't the power available for that sort of uh, facility. But I believe some vessels like the ferries could look at cold ironing for the time that they're in port. But it's incredibly expensive. And again, there's the, the uh, lack of certainty as to whether or not the, the power is available there for it. And at the end of the day, is the power being generated by a coal-burning power station? So are you really achieving anything? The, the modern efficient engines on vessels are probably providing quite efficient power anyway. Well, I was also thinking when we took some evidence in, at our um, uh, consideration of the, of the budget um, earlier and... Um, there, there are obviously new transport information systems, uh, log development in logistics as well. Um, do, are all these applied in terms of, of, of your particular industry? The sophisticated logistics uh, support system that our, our users use, the oil and gas companies, for uh, sort of being as efficient as possible with the movement of goods and things. There's a lot of investment in technology there. We have our own technology in, in making information available on our website that, as to where vessels are and, and what have you is, is there. But again, ports can contribute towards this, but they wouldn't be the major players in, in that. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe. Thank you. Can I just ask about government support and, and policy? Because there was a, a feeling in the submission that we, the submissions we received that, in relation to policy, it should be very much hands off and, and private sector led. But can the panel identify any particular policy or regulatory obstacles that um, impact on the free flow of freight by sea, road, and rail? And is there anything in particular government can do? to help with the interconnectivity of freight? Who would like to start? Well, um, I haven't hit an obstacle. And put it this way, if I had uh, hit an obstacle that was created by the government, mm. I would react immediately by going back through MSPs, probably, okay. uh, who are with local... Uh, familiarity to the problem, mm -hmm. but it's not something that arises easily. Okay. 
I, I think both individually as a, as a port and as the associations, both British mm. Ports Association and the UK mm. Major Ports Group, we have a very good working relationship with Transport yes. Scotland. Mm. Uh, and I find them very um, user-friendly mm. compared with uh, their counterpart down south. I, would sort of, I wouldn't want to suggest any changes there. Okay. Yeah. Mr. I agree. I think the only thing, we've, we've already talked about the accessibility to grants and, and the road connections. I think the only other thing is a, a more joined up approach on forecasting future market demand with yeah. others in the UK and a better awareness of what's going on in the continent would, would help. Mm -hmm. um, because when we're talking about trade and facilitating trade and awareness of what's going on elsewhere, I think is really important and a consistency of approach and forecasting mm -hmm. uh, between Scotland and the rest of the UK as well. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, regulation works really well. Yes. What about um, planning, the planning policies? <coughs> Do you see um, any issues with the planning system um, in relation to the national, national planning framework? D does all of that function effectively with your, your setup and your, your, your strategies for, for planning ahead? At, at Aberdeen, with our Nig Bay project, mm. we've, we sort of got involved in, in sort of trying to become a project in the NPF3, mm. and, and that was very successful. And, and we found dealing with uh, Mr. Mackay, who sat here before me, um, mm. and, and his uh, officials, very, very effective. So we can only say yes to that, that. That seems to work. What I would suggest was, as I mentioned earlier, if you are an NPF3 project, I think you should perhaps receive more support beyond that because part of the NIG Bay uh, designation in MPF3 is the fact that the supporting infrastructure, and, and I think there could be more funding put towards that in, in, mm. the, in the future. Okay. Mr. Patterson? I've always found at all levels that politicians and ports uh, are very keen to be of assistance and that uh, when I've been applying for... Um, grants, particularly in Peterhead, um, uh, there was great support from uh, pol politicians at all levels. Okay. Mr McGinley or Mr Hammond? Yeah, I think we're, we're pretty much in the same place, really. Um, we work very closely with, uh, with local Fife Council in terms of the MPF for Fife, and indeed have worked very closely with yourselves in terms of the, the mm. national planning framework. So we're very comfortable with it. Okay. I, I would agree. I don't think there's any comments to be made about Scotland any more than the rest of the UK. I think we all push for a more efficient, mm. streamlined planning system. I personally think that when there are controversial planning applications, the arguments can easily get aired in the first few months of the application, but it tends to take too long to air the mm. arguments. But that, that's not just a problem in Scotland. That seems yeah. to me to be a problem everywhere. So if there were some way to shorten that process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your positive responses. Thank you, Convene. Thank you, David. Um, could I ask the witnesses about Scottish Government policy as far as your industry is concerned? If each of you were Minister of Transport for the day, what would your priorities be for your industry? Mr Hammond? I would want to support greater connectivity. I would uh, be very supportive of coastal shipping and a transparent grant system. And I would make sure that our ports had proper road connectivity as well. So those would be the priorities which we've already touched on. Thank you for that. Mr McGinley? I think for me it's probably th um, more about communication between ports and engagement between ports in Scotland. I don't think we do mm. enough of that and um, potentially we could open up a whole load of, uh, of, of areas um, mm. if we were just a bit more connected. Okay, Mr Parker? Mm. We're hosting the Scottish Ports meeting next month, so David, if you want to come along to that, you certainly there'll be ports from all over Scotland involved in that meeting. But um, I think to support what what Charles said, uh, I think it's that last mile that uh, the department, uh, sorry, British Ports Association mentioned. It, it's it's recognition by roads authorities of how significant that is. I think that applies for airports as well. Certainly does in Aberdeen, but for for the ports. I think the recognition of how important that is uh, and, mm. and the com competition it faces with, with other, other uh, road users, but how, how significantly important it is for maximising the efficiency of getting freight off the roads. Oh, Mr. Parkinson? Yeah, I'm, I'm in 
Colin here and I have both uh, been in the chair of the Scottish Ports Group of the British Ports Association in the past. And that is a very strong association within the BPA, where the uh, envy of England in that respect. And because um, we share ideas with each other, despite the fact that we might be in competition with each other, uh, we feel that we're putting our best feet forward thereby. Right. And, and the, the, as I said earlier, the politicians uh, get the honest truth from us. Right, thank you. I suppose a related question is, do we need a refresh um, of the Scottish Government's freight policy? I'll start in the reverse order. Mr Patterson? I don't, I don't think there's anything that needs a drastic uh, resetting. Okay. Thank you. Mr Parker? Thank Everything's you. always worthy of review, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't want to say no. Um, it would certainly be welcome if, if, if it was to achieve anything, yes. Yeah, I think I'm in the same place as Colin. I mean, why not? Thank you. Mr Hammond? Yeah, it's a greater profile for the freight policy and a, maybe a change of emphasis. Thank you. And my, my final question is about uh, best practice. Do any of the witnesses have best practice in uh, other European countries of how there's excellence in terms of, of freight or your industry generally that you can point to, particularly where government's got a role? Um, so is there examples you could give us that we could perhaps uh, share with the Scottish Government about how it works in practice? Mr Hammond? Uh, I, I wouldn't. Um, I would say, uh, to be honest with you, the, the less government interferes in some of these things, the better. Uh, that's, that's my view. I would say that uh, we quite happily operate both north and south of the border with minimal interference. I think the advantage Scotland has is the short lines of communication, which are, are not in evidence in the rest of the UK. So that's, mm. uh, I, would, I would have to say that's, that's pretty good. Mm. Um, but I can't think of anything uh, more to add than that. Thank you. Mr McGinley? No, I think, um, I think Colin, I just said it, Charles has just said it all, really. I'm, I'm there as well. Okay. Mr Parker? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the party line. <laughs> yes, <laughs> likewise. <laughs> right. <laughs> On that consensual note, I'll hand back to the convener. Uh, th thank you very much. And just finally, uh, gentlemen, um, of all the points that have been made today and that we've teased out in our evidence session, is there any one thing that you would like to leave the committee with as a take-home message? All I would say is that Scotland's ports do not lack ambition, don't lack the capacity to invest, and are up for business opportunities. Okay, thank you. I think um, I'll probably start, uh, finish where I started, which is that, you know, from an engineering uh, business basis, with a, with a port attached to it, um, you know, we hope to grow and develop and take that port forward um, into the 20s and 30s and so on. And um, any support that we can get from that from the government will be welcome. OK, thank you. Uh, ports is a long-term business. You have to take a long-term view of, of investment. And I, think I welcome this opportunity to speak to, to this uh, committee. And uh, if it helps the profile, well and good. But we, we, uh, to back what Charles has said, a higher profile would be much appreciated. Thank you. I'll give you the final word, Mr. Parker. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that uh, you know our first audience uh, is our customer, and we pay attention to that. And uh, like Colin, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to come and give evidence today, and also to hear what you people have to say about us. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. In that case, can I thank all of the witnesses for their evidence uh, this morning? and thank them for their attendance. Um, we'll now have a short, allow a short suspension for the witnesses to leave the room um, before resuming our, our agenda. Thank you.
Right, colleagues, um, the final item on the agenda today is for the committee to consider and agree its EU priorities for 2015-16 and to appoint a new EU rapporteur. Um, can I invite members to consider and agree the priorities as within the European Commission work programme for the coming year is set out in the paper that has been circulated prior to the meeting uh, by the clerks. Okay. Um, are there are no comments arising from the paper. In that case, the committee has agreed to agree its priorities for the coming year as set out in the paper. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to appoint a new EU rapporteur. Um, members have been circulated in advance of the meeting and we have one um, expression of interest from Dave Stewart who said that he would he would be very happy to take on that, that role. Uh, is the committee agreed? Okay, that onerous uh, responsibility falls to you, David. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to set out your, prior, your priorities for the coming year as EU rapporteur? Okay, that's fine. Um, in that case, um, happy that we've we've appointed the Dave Stewart as the new EU rapporteur. Uh, that concludes this item and concludes today's committee business in public. Thank you.